Welcome to uh, chapter three. I want to look more at some sources where we need to be very careful to think about who produced them and with what aim in mind. Uh, so here, our next source is, as you can see, uh, posters. Now, um, uh, you can see this one, which is from uh, the time uh, in the war where uh, Germany was able to bomb a few towns around the coast of Britain using airships. Uh, and here you have the uh, uh, government poster. It is far better to face the bullets than to be killed at home by a bomb. Join the army at once and help to stop an air raid. Uh, and so here you can see then, first of all, the result of the fact that the, uh, um, the government and the army had decided not to go for conscription. Big contrast with France on the first day in France, all the men between uh, uh, certain ages were automatically uh, part of the army, including priests and other people who were, uh, were not uh, uh, involved uh, in Britain who were treated in a different way. Whereas in Britain, they were obliged to launch a campaign to recruit people. Uh, and uh, posters was one of the ways they, they did this. Of course, posters are the importance of the, of the visual, um, the point importance of the, uh, the, the dramatic or even the melodramatic. And these are relatively easy uh, sources to use because they represent a, a, a fairly official point of view. You know what the priorities of the people uh, producing them are. Here's another one. Remember Scarborough? Scarborough is a seaside town where people were killed by bombs. Uh, the so very small numbers. What well, it's it, everything's comparative, of course. Uh, uh, but uh, the numbers of people, the numbers of civilians killed by bombs in Britain in the Second World War were was hundreds of times higher. But nevertheless, this was uh, uh, particularly shocking for people because it was the first time um, that uh, towns had been bombed uh, uh, in Britain. Uh, people were uh, ex were used to Britain fighting wars a long way away, the Anglo-Zulu War and the uh, second half of the uh, uh, of the nineteenth century, uh, the the the, uh, the um, war, the, what the Indians uh, often call the First War of Independence, in which the uh, Br uh, British uh, establishment referred to as the the Indian Mutiny in 1857. Was a, we used to uh, wars being pretty distant, uh, and so uh, uh, when the bombs came to Scarborough, this was a great uh, shock. So this poster goes on to say, uh, "The Germans who brag of their culture have shown what it is made of by murdering defenceless women and children at Scarborough." But this only strengthens Great Britain's resolve to crush the German barbarians. So something very. Um, very clear um, form of poster uh, propaganda there. And I, I think I have one of the most famous one, of course, Britain's Lord Kitchener wants you. Yeah, Lord Kitchener, not, not, not necessary to put his name on that. Everybody knows who he was. He's a, a hero, uh, in inverted commas, of the uh, British Empire in, in Africa. Uh, and you know the fact that he needs you uh, for the duration of the war uh, is uh, um, something which is supposed to be um, in sync. Uh, a lot of people did uh, join the army, partly for excitement, partly for patriotism, uh, also partly for uh, uh, less agreeable reasons. Uh, many of the prisons were emptied of their of, of their uh, their inhabitants. So uh, along the lines of, oh, well, you still have two years to to run, but if you join the army, we'll let you go. Uh, and similarly, uh, similarly, many uh, homeless uh, men were were pushed along in the same way. Uh, occasionally, uh, 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 occasionally, patriotic um, employers would would order their uh, workers to. Uh, joined the, um, the 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 army. Although, of course, there were also those who joined f uh, through patriotic enthusiasm or through shock uh, at what they had learnt about the German invasion of Belgium, which was certainly extremely um, bloody and cruel. Um, this argument of how enthusiastic people were about the First World War is one of the big debates of the historiography of the First World War. No final answer is available, uh, but certainly uh, earlier historians who had spoken of the enthusiastic crowds in the, in the streets have been corrected more recently, in particular by a book by Adrian Gregory. Um, I think it's called The Last Great War. Um, and um, 
government who looked more at the makeup of these uh, uh, demonstrations uh, was able to show that it tended to be a middle class um, minority who were um, enthusiastically demonstrated, <coughs> demonstrating in favour in favor of continuing the war. Another poster here, yes, and this is still po government posters, National Service Women Clerks Wanted at Once for Service in France with the British Army. So this shows uh, uh, one aspect of the history of the war, um, that as the war went on, uh, and they didn't have enough soldiers. One of the uh, one of the responses, as we shall see in 1916, uh, was conscription. But another was re response was to replace those soldiers in France who were not in the fighting roles, because uh, to keep an army, uh, you need a huge uh, backup of cooks and secretaries and transport drivers and ambulance drivers and so on. And and women were brought into uh, more and more uh, roles there. I think I have one last example here. Yes, this is actually an American one. It's just I liked it. Yeah, give to the American Chocolate Fund for U.S. forces um, uh, in, in in France. There was a uh, tremendous mobilization also in Britain from along the lines of help our soldiers. I always I really mentioned the campaign to send a million cigarettes uh, and certainly sending chocolate or uh, knitting clothes for uh, soldiers uh, in the um, in the uh, in the in the trenches was uh, was uh, a very popular activity and sometimes mocked in popular songs or in, in cartoons and there's a famous uh, um, well a well known popular song of this time uh, sister susie's sewing shirts for soldiers which is both a a tongue twister and a, a, a comic song uh, about your know, people uh, um, working hard to provide the, the soldiers with things. Uh, indeed, soldiers certainly needed private help because, for example, if you wanted some sort of bulletproof um, vest, they did exist at the time, but you could only have one if you bought your own. And in the newspapers in Britain at the time, you can see um, pictures and adverts saying, you know, this is uh, this will protect you against bullets and you can buy it for so much and send it out to your brother or uh, husband fighting in the trenches. Uh, I haven't been able to find out how popular they were and certainly they probably would have some uh, problems in being seen as uh, not appropriate for um, brave masculinity which uh, the soldiers were supposed to be showing. Now here we have a series of images which perhaps at first sight might be thought of as comparable to the posters, but they're not really. Um, these are postcards. Uh, so here we have a postcard mocking the uh, German Navy, showing them as terrible, uh, uh, terribly uh, uh, lazy and old. Uh, this postcard uh, simply shows um, the Kaiser uh, in a difficult situation and no doubt uh, um, on, well on the way to losing the war. Uh, this one shows the uh, the um, Ulster um, regiments or the Ulster people supporting the British Empire with an inspiring slogan, how is freedom measured by the effort which it costs to retain freedom so a patriotic and uh, um, militaristic um, sl uh, slogan there. And finally, this one, the kitchen is the key to victory, eat less bread. Uh, now, so these are postcards. And uh, what is important about postcards, and there has been books written about postcards of the First World War, uh, is to, again, to look at the grammar. These are not produced by government. They are produced by small publishers whose first aim is to sell postcards. They may well be patriotic or humorous or, or, or otherwise as, as individuals, uh, but their, their aim is to sell postcards. And so what they put on the postcards is what they think will people want to buy. And that's very interesting because that means that uh, you can compare, if you like, um, what themes are put forward by politicians or uh, bishops or um, newspaper editors or, uh, and so on and so forth with uh, small scale production uh, for a popular market and postcards is one of the examples uh, of, of how, you, how you can do that. We have one more there. This is a little uh, um, a humorous thing, a call to arms. Yes. Yeah. Well, why aren't girls in the army? Tell me if you can, for they can carry 
the, the, obey the call to arms as well as any map. So it's a little, uh, uh, a little joke um, about the, the, this is a, you know, Edwardian humor. And many, for many sources left. Um, this is the one that I know most about uh, because this, I don't know if you, you know what it is. Well, I just told you, in fact, this is, a, this is sheet music. This is sheet music. And then we have three examples. Uh, Sister Susie's sewing the shirts for soldiers. Roses of Picardy. And the ragtime, the ragtime soldier man. And I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. It's a long way, way to Tipperary. So four, um, four songs there. One humorous song. One romantic song. Um, but yeah, but about uh, being uh, being in Picardy, which of course is abroad for the British soldiers uh, and the, the the women they met there. A humorous song again, the Ragtime Soldier Man. A ragtime uh, had been brought into uh, Britain at the very end of the 19th century, but was still is still very often uh, mocked. There's a well-known um, uh, anti-suffragette song called the Ragtime Suffragette. And an anti-war song, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier. I brought him up to be my pride and joy. Who dares to put a musket on his shoulder to shoot some other mother's darling boy? Uh, let nations uh, arbitrate their future problems. It's time to put the sword and gun away. There'd be no war today if every mother would. If every mother would say, "I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier." Yeah. So here we have sheet music. Now, what can you do as a source with this? Of course, what you're not allowed to do as a source with this is collect 25 songs that you find interesting. Uh, and then write a view of history based on the 25 songs. People have done this, but this is this is not history because you have to have a corpus. Uh, and this is where uh, this is what what was my job as a historian uh, in, in that I began by finding 1,200 songs from during the the four years of the war. This is not it's not surprising that there should be so many uh, today. There are many many songs. Um, um, and produced. Uh, and the grammar of these songs is that they are sold as sheet music. There were, I think, three million pianos in Britain in 1914. It was very common to have a piano or to know somebody had a, uh, had a piano. Even in a uh, working class um, part of town, there would be pianos available in the pub uh, or uh, uh, there's a, a, an excellent book um, called uh, The Classic Slum, uh, about a small shopkeeper's boy uh, in a very poor part of town. And they had a, they bought a second-hand piano. Uh, the piano was tremendously present. Uh, and people would, would sing a lot. Remember, they have no radio. The gramophone exists, but it's a, it's a luxury uh, to buy a cheap, the cheapest gramophone in 1916. You can go 200 times to the to the musical to the musical theatre uh, uh, and so the uh, the the sheet the, the the sheet music and the and the popular songs are a, a very interesting source uh, again the grammar of this source is that the writers want to give the people something that will be um, enjoyable to them and very differently from today, because today, if we listen to a song, we might listen to it on Spotify or on a uh, an MP3 player. At the time, people would listen to songs at the music hall, and the centre of the music hall was everybody singing along. Uh, what, there's, there, there were technical reasons for this. There were no no microphones on stage until the end of the 1920s, uh, and so in the new musicals, which have three or four thousand seats, the singer can't really get an atmosphere going unless they can get everybody to sing along in the chorus. Um, and these uh, these uh, singers, rather than being virtuosos, were mostly um, uh, animators of a public evening. So it was, you know, all oh, right, no, let's just have all the men singing this time. Oh, I'm sure the women can do better. And this kind of uh, atmosphere fair going on. But this grammar of these songs, that the centre um, of their performance was everybody singing along, uh, affected very much the contents uh, because you must have everybody singing along, or at least 80% of the, the hall singing along. If half the people are singing, you might not have a job next week because your job is to get people singing. And this is the reason that 
the contents of the songs reflects what is consensual among, in particular, the working class who are the mass audience of the music hall. This means that enthusiastic songs about war can be found in September 1914 and in October 1914. By the time the lists of dead and wounded are coming in, very rapidly, it's no longer possible to get everybody to sing about how wonderful it is to join the army. And so in, in 1915, even though the government is still working extremely hard to try to get people to volunteer to join the army, in the greatest hits collection of that year, there are no recruitment songs at all. Uh, and the, uh, the enthusiastic songs about war are gradually replaced by other things that can get everybody to sing that are consensual perhaps dreaming of the end of the war that's a great uh, uh, a great winner uh, perhaps just talking about something completely different only one third of my 1200 songs which i collected only one third of them actually mentioned the war in any way at all um, they continue singing about what they used to sing before before the war, which could be everyday trivia. I remember there's a, a well-known song, uh, um, I Can't Do My Belly Bottom Button Up, which is about it being difficult to fasten your waistcoat. Yeah, I'm not sure if you, you can actually do a rap about this, but maybe you could. Um, there are uh, many songs about food, a large number of songs about food. And I suspect that this might be partly connected to the fact that people, a lot of people in the audience knew what it was like to be hungry. Uh, a very large number of, of songs about love, of course, and um, 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 finding, finding the perfect girl in particular. Uh, these are not complicated psychological songs about heartbreak. Uh, they, they, they tend to be uh, extremely simple, not that romantic, actually, more perfection, more, more portraying for perfection than, than, than romantic. So you have songs about perfect girlfriends, about horrible wives. Um, humorous songs are extremely common, much more common to today than today. Humor is at the center uh, of popular song uh, during, during, the, during the, fir the, the, the First World War. Just one more example about how this, uh, this grammar of the song, that is the, the fact that the center is, the, is all singing together at the music hall. There are no songs uh, which are insulting to Germans, um, which is quite surprising in some ways, because you have sketches, you have sketches on the musical stage, where it's, that's short plays of 10 minutes or so, where uh, Germans are portrayed as absolutely horrible people. But the song is different. Can you get everybody to sing along together that we hate Germans, that Germans are inferior? It doesn't seem so. And uh, then the question for the historian is, why is this the case? Well, of course, I cannot be absolutely certain, but the German people were very close to the English people before the um, first, first World War. A large number of Germans worked in London, especially as waiters. That was, uh, uh, and the German band um, was a very popular part of popular entertainment, in, indeed, in the uh, one of the best known of the musical songs uh, down at the old Bull and Bush. They actually talk about a German band, uh, yeah, uh, here the little German band. Um, and so it seems that getting everybody to sing together about the Germans being horrible was not so easy. And so anything which was not consensual got pushed out. And so let's sing about something else. And the best of all is singing about the end of the war, a song like Keep the Home Fires Burning. I will take a little time a little later on to give you some more details about popular song in the in the First World War because that was that is my particular um, special special speciality. Um, what happened when I did this study is that I discovered that in many many history books they mentioned in passing a couple of paragraphs about popular songs and they always quoted the same ten or twenty songs which have not been forgotten. Unfortunately, there were over a thousand which have been forgotten. In fact, I had a collection of 1,200, but I suspect that in total there were um, four or 5,000 published during the war in Britain or published in America, but well known in Britain. Uh, and so really the conclusions that the historians previously had, had taken from this 
10 or 20 songs were just completely false. Uh, and in particular, um, they tended to uh, uh, identify popular songs as generally enthusiastic about the war. Absolute nonsense. Only a third of them mentioned the war, and most of those are not enthusiastic about the war. On the other hand, it's, you will not be surprised to know that it was not possible to get everybody to sing along in the musical against the war. We don't want the war, we want to stop the war. Uh, and so a song like I Didn't Raise My Boy to Be a Soldier, which was very well known in Britain, it was actually an American song, uh, written and, and popular before America entered the war. Nevertheless, it's almost certain that this song was not sung on the musical stage. It would be sung in the anti-war meetings, the political anti-war meetings, which could get to a certain size. In 1916, the Stop the War um, uh, movement uh, had was able to have uh, meetings in most towns of more than 20,000 people or so. And they had a national conference in London with hundreds of delegates. That was its, its uh, uh, strongest uh, 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 moment. But to get people to sing along at the musical, that was not going to be possible. Sheet music. I will play, I'll play you some, uh, or, or I'll put some uh, links on the, uh, I'll put some links on the, what's the word, the blog. Uh, and here you have the, 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 the result. This is the, the book which I published in 2015. This is where I get to talk about all the wonderful things I've done, but it I won't be very long. Uh, the show must go on, popular song in Britain during the First World War. Uh, now, uh, if you want to write a history book, it's great fun, but uh, don't do it for the money. I think I've made 600 euros from that little four years. Anyway, uh, the photograph that you can see here is a fascinating one because this is the three characters from a particular uh, review. So a uh, uh, an evening um, um, show uh, on, sta on the stage of a musical. Um, and they are about to go on stage and sing what will be one of the smash hits um, of the wartime. And it's, uh, uh, if you were the only girl in the world uh, and I was the only boy. Uh, what's fascinating about this is, is it's very much not a, um, what's the word? It, it's very much not a typical uh, song. It's a romantic song. It's if you were the only girl in the world and I was the only boy, nothing else would matter in this world today. We just go on loving in the same old way. Um, and so it is, it is a, a romantic tone. And the romantic tone is very rare in the music hall. Uh, and interestingly enough, as you can see, the, the people uh, were, uh, what's the word, the, the people were, um, the people who were singing it were dressed in comic costume, and they, in they had intended to sing it as a comic song, mocking the romance, and at the very last moment, they decided to play it, to sing it straight. Uh, and this was a moment I think they kind of understood because they were show people, they kind of understood that during the war, so many people had suffered in their relationships that it was possible to be romantic in a way um, that previously uh, was, 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 was not less possible. Let's see if we can um, have uh, a, 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 a listen to the song. I'm not sure if the technology is, uh, uh, is, 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 up, is up to it, but it might be. No, I'm afraid not. Uh, in particular, it's, it wants to do a do a. Uh, 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 wants to do a. Uh, what's the word? An advert first. Never mind. Okay. Well, I will. Br I will start the next chapter with some songs that I can organise the technology for it, uh, and uh, we're going to stop there for the moment. That's also half an hour. That was. That's almost half an hour. That was chapter three. Uh, I still have some sources to talk about. Um, and then we will go on to um, other uh, questions. Thank you for your attention.